he's my partner and um, look forward to hearing what he's got to say as usual. And uh, again, your question should go in the chat and I'll keep track of those and we'll have a session after that. Thank you. Adam, all yours. Thanks, Brian. Um, can everyone hear me? First of all, if you can, just shake your head. Yes, yes. Yes, okay. So we're gonna get started. So um, this is sort of like GERD 101. Uh, and sort of what is it, why does it happen, and some of the techniques to treat it. Um, so we'll go through, and again, like Brian said, hopefully we have a little bit of time for some questions at the end. Uh, no disclosures. So just a little outline of what we're going to talk about. So we'll talk about what is GERD, why it's important, uh, why does it happen, how, how do we diagnose it, what are some of the treatments that could potentially be offered, and then we'll wrap things up with a summary at the end. So what's GERD? So there's a symptom-based definition and it's listed here. It's upper abdominal or substernal burning pain or indigestion radiating upward, you know, namely heartburn. That's the way everyone terms it uh, from reflux of stomach contents, which cause symptoms or complications. Then there's the pathologic definition, which is a little bit more strictly defined. Um, and it consists of abnormal acid exposure in the esophagus, which is typically defined by one of two things, or most of the time, two things for us is a pH test and or endoscopic biopsy proven esophagitis. Um, it's often associated with a hiatal hernia around 50% of people. Um, so it's a pretty big problem. Um, it's one of the more common disorders of the upper GI tract. Around 40% of Americans report heartburn at least once a month and around 10% report it daily. Uh, it does have an impact on uh, people's quality of life to a varying degree. Um, and it's an impact on the medical system. Um, there's about 10 million office visits per year that are related to GERD. Um, I couldn't find how many ER visits are related to GERD, but I would assume there's quite a few. There's a bit of overlap between heart chest pain problems, which are related to your heart and GERD. And so when people get pain in their chest, they tend to go to the ER. Um, it does lead to some decrease in productivity and absenteeism which I saw one estimate of around $75 billion a year. So what are the symptoms of GERD? They can be broken down into typical and atypical symptoms. I'm a very simple person. I think of typical symptoms as the stuff you typically hear about on television. Um, so heartburn, right? that's a burning sensation in your upper abdomen, which radiates towards your head and is often felt underneath your breastbone. It tends to be made worse or exacerbated by larger meals, fatty foods, caffeine, wine. Um, it does improve with antacids or some anti-secretory meds, H2 blockers, PPIs, essentially, you know, the most common one is anything that ends in prizole. Uh, regurgitation uh, is another common typical symptom um, and dysphagia, which is difficulty in swallowing. So when somebody says dysphagia, is food getting stuck or is it having trouble going down? Then there are the atypical symptoms. Uh, these are the things you less commonly hear about and are less commonly advertised. Um, and those can be broken down into respiratory symptoms or chest pain symptoms. So chest pain, about 50% of severe chest pain with normal cardiac testing can be traced back to people having GERD. Uh, and then the respiratory symptoms, which can be particularly troublesome, uh, namely chronic coughing, pneumonias, particularly aspiration pneumonias, uh, hoarseness, sore throat, uh, recurrent episodes of bronchitis, uh, which can actually lead to drop in pulmonary function, uh, asthma, and wheezing. Um, so this is just a, a view of the, the of the GE junction. Um, towards the top of the screen would be your head. Towards the bottom of the screen would be your feet. This here is your diaphragm. And you know most people think about the GE junction is just sort of a muscle. It's actually a combination of a multitude of different things. I don't have the, the sort of the time in this talk to go through the specifics of what each part contributes, but it's more than a, a muscle. And so one of the things that I typically see in the office is people coming in and they're saying, you know, my GI doctor said that you could just tighten up the sphincter. That's not a thing. <laughs> okay. So it's, it, there's a lot of different things that go into the competency or incompetency of a GE junction. And this is just to illustrate that there's a bunch of different components to your GE junction. So what are, what are some of the causes of GERD? It's, it's often multifactorial. It's not typically one thing or the other. There is a contributor with impaired motor function of the esophagus. 
decreased resting tone of the lower esophageal sphincter, which is sort of the, the door between the esophagus and the stomach over here on the right. Um, some of the structural support of the GE junction, uh, namely the diaphragm or the hiatus, the muscle that the esophagus passes through, can loosen up. You can have abnormal contractivity or delayed gastric emptying of your stomach. You can have an increase in gastric acid production from a multitude of reasons. You can also have non-acid reflux, right? It's less common, but you can have reflux of bile and other enzymes that are typically outside of the stomach going backwards. And then hiatal hernias tend to uh, contribute, which I'll talk about in a second. So what is a hiatal hernia? This is sort of a, a view of what a, on the left is a view of a normal stomach. The, the muscle fibers here are the crural fibers of the diaphragm. There's a normal split in here that your esophagus passes through to lead into the stomach. This is normal. What a hiatal hernia is, is you get widening of these crural fibers here. It allows the stomach to move up. And if you, you think about it from a, just a mechanical standpoint, you now have stomach that's straddling two different pressure zones. Right, your stomach, your abdomen, which is tends to be positively pressured. Right, you have other organs. You have abdominal wall tone. Every time you bear down, you increase the the the, the pressure in your abdomen, and then every time you take a breath in, you negatively pressurize your chest. Right, so it sort of forms a a sink to push stuff the wrong way. Uh, and this is all in combination with your GE junction, which is up here losing its competency when it winds up in your chest. A lot of that stuff that I showed you on the previous slide, all those contributors, when those get stretched out and attenuated, you know, it's, that door is no longer closed. So you have a pressure pushing stuff the wrong way and then a door that's open to allow stuff into your esophagus. Uh, just another view of a hiatal hernia. This is a prettier picture. Um, just going through what I just said. So what are the treatment options? There's a couple different types of options. There's medical uh, options. These typically consist of some medications that we'll talk about. There's augmentation of the valve. Uh, that's a Lynx device that's in that person's hand. And then there's reconstructive options, typically consisting of hiatal hernia repairs and fundoplications. Uh, so the first step in this is always lifestyle management. Um, you know, most of the time when people see us in the office, they've done a fair amount of this stuff already. Um, but it typically involves food avoidance. Um, you know, everybody has their own trigger foods. I've, I've personally stopped trying to predict what are certain people's trigger foods because they're all over the place. Um, but the most common ones tend to be spicier, fatty foods. Um, things that are heavily caffeinated can also cause issues. Alcohol and tobacco are two big ones. Um, things that have a high acidity to them, tomato, stuff that has, um, uh, chocolate or peppermint in it. And then the tannins and wine can actually cause issues too. So wine tends to be a big one. Um, so there's diet modification. And again, it typically involves mostly food avoidance or moderation. One of the things that's not on here is carbonated beverages can often cause issues too. Um, so people who drink a lot of soda, carbonated water, things like that, which makes sense, right? It just overpressurizes your stomach and pushes stuff the wrong way. Um, weight loss is a big component. Um, Elevating your head of bed at night uh, can be helpful. You know, a big one is there, there tends to be a lot of people who snack late at night and, you know, you eat and then you lay flat to go to bed. That's just using gravity the wrong way. Things tend to make their way the wrong way when you lay, when you lay flat after eating. And then avoiding tight clothes, um, I've found to varying success. So there's a lot of different medications that people use. Most of them are over the counter now, and there are there are some prescription ones. The over the counter ones tend to be the ones here on the left, you know, antacids. It's the stuff, you know, Tums and Mylanta and Gaviscon, as well as H2 blockers, which are histamine blockers, famotidine, cimetidine, and then the PPIs are the ones, proton pump inhibitors that are most commonly used, and essentially the esomeprazole and omeprazole. Um, anything that ends in prazole is a PPI. And then there's other options if those don't work, if the over-the-counter uh, medications don't work. You can either double up on dosing um, or you can go to some heavier hitters such as Lansoprazole, Pansoprazole, or Dexalent. Um, and I think there's a newer medication coming out which might be available in December, if I remember correctly, that works in a slightly different mechanism. Um, so how well do people do uh, in terms of treating them with medications? Well, it, you know, depending on the symptom, 
um, the success is anywhere between 30 and, you know, 55% or so. So some people do get a, do get a benefit from it. Some people don't. Um, and it's, it's, it's symptom dependent. Um, and that's just a little graphic representation of that. Um, so, so when do we do GERD testing, right? So there's a lot of people walking around with GERD who have never had GERD testing before. Um, so the most common one is failure, failure of response to PPI trial. So if you go to a GI doctor or a, or a primary care doctor and you have symptoms that are, you know, typical GERD, you're, you're probably not going to wind up in an endoscopy suite with one of us. The first thing you'll probably do is they'll probably try a PPI. Um, and if you have adequate symptom response to that and your quality of life is okay, you may very well never wind up in a surgeon's office. Um, but the most common thing that we see is if you fail to respond to PPIs in terms of a, a positive response, i.e. your symptoms go away. That's probably the most common reason that, that we see people. The other, the other fairly common reason we see it is, you know, people developing alarm symptoms or red flag symptoms. And what are those? So dysphagia is a big one, right? So, you know, you're eating and food's getting stuck. And, and that, that can be to varying degrees. That can be, you know, something gets stuck, you, you take a big slug of water and then it winds up going the right place it's supposed to. Or on the extreme end, you eat something, it gets stuck and you wind up in the emergency room and a GI doctor is fishing out steak from your esophagus. Like it can, it can run the gamut. Um, some people aspirate, right? So you're eating and things are refluxing up and, you know, food particles and, and the chemicals namely acid and bile, they're winding up in your lungs and you get a, a chemical pneumonitis from it or an inflammation of your lungs. Some people in particular, people who have larger hernias, they can get ulcers or even in folks that don't have ulcers, they can wind up anemic. Um, you know, people wind up on iron pills, getting IV iron. Rarely people wind up with transfusions, but some people can have, you know, decent bleeding episodes from, um, from these hernias. Persistent chest pain, weight loss, food avoidance in particular, uh, and persistent vomiting. There's a couple different tests. Um, I've I've list, listed these in, in, in order going from left to right, from least annoying to most annoying tests. So on the left is, a, is an EGD, that's an endoscope. We typically just, we look down, we get a lay of the anatomy, we look at the landmarks. Uh, there's some, there's certain things that are important in surgical planning um, that are important to identify. Uh, you also want to make sure that there's nothing suspicious, you know, Barrett's esophagus and things like that. At the same time, we do the endoscopy. We usually leave a pH probe down. That's in the middle here. The most common one is a Bravo pH probe. That's a wireless pH probe. That's about the size of a, I don't know, a small to medium sized paper clip that clips onto the bottom of your esophagus and then it falls off and you poop it out a couple of days later and you don't have to fetch it and you, and you get a little box that wirelessly records the, the data and it um, helps us calculate a composite score called a Demeester score. And that's how we figure out in reference to the rest of the population, how abnormal is your acid exposure? Uh, a barium swallow is just a simple test where you, you swallow some contrast. Again, it's more of a functional study we're able to look down, see how well stuff either does or doesn't go through your esophagus. Is it hung up in your stomach? Are there any strictures? I personally think it's one of the better things for looking at how big a hernia is, because sometimes when you're doing an endoscopy and things are sort of bouncing around, it's hard to, it's really hard to tell um, just how big things are or what type specifically of a hernia it is. Um, and then probably the most annoying test out of any of this is esophageal manometry. That's a, that's a little probe. It's about the width of a mouse wire that has a series of pressure sensors along it, and it gets inserted into your nose. You swallow it. It sits in your esophagus for about a half hour, um, and then some of the specialized endoscopy nurses run you through a series of swallowing studies, both dry swallows and some wet swallows with small aliquots of water, uh, and it allows us to really gauge how strong or conversely how weak your esophageal function is, if there's a corresponding esophageal motility disorder. Is it even GERD? Is it something else? And it also helps us to determine. Um, it gives us an idea of of how I guess how tight uh, GE junction reconstruction should you be able to tolerate. It helps sort of tailor what kind of repair we're doing. Um, so you know, what are the reasons we typically offer surgery? There's some definitive, and then there's some strong indications for surgery. So the the ones on the top. 
you know, hard indications for surgery. If you have esophageal damage, that's not healing, right? A persistent ulcer that's bleeding, Barrett's esophagus that's progressing. Those, those tend to be indications, pretty hard indications to operate. Aspiration events, pneumonias, um, or obstructive symptoms from a hernia. There's some strong indications for surgery um, that we often operate on as well. Um, if you have medication intolerances, if your symptom control is really poor on, on uh, medications or with conservative measures. If you have persistent Barrett's despite optimal medical therapy, or if you're a particularly young patient who has medication dependence, right? If you're 20 and you've been on a PPI since you were 12, right? average life expectancy in America is probably around 80-ish. Like, do you really want to be on medication for 70, 60 years? Probably not, right? So something to think about. And, you know, most common indicator is quality of life, right? It's, it's a Surgery is a good alternative to long-term medication use. So, you know, one of the things we're constantly thinking about in the office is, you know, the hardest part is to try to pick out, well, who, who, is, who, do, who do we think we can help with surgery, right? Because theoretically, we can operate on everybody, but... That's not ethical, number one. And number two, you wanna, you wanna operate on people you think you could help. Um, so there was a study a while back where they looked at, you know, what, are, what is prognostic of, of a good response to surgery? And the, and the big three that they found was, do you have a response, response to antacid medications? Namely, do your symptoms go away or do they get markedly better with, with antacids or PPIs? They also found that people who have typical symptoms, you know, heartburn and regurgitation, they tend to respond better to surgery. And if you have abnormal pH testing, namely a Demeester score over 14.7, which documents that you have abnormal acid exposure in your esophagus, those people do well. So, so the, the folks that we love operating on is, you know, you have an abnormal Demeester score, you have typical symptoms, and your symptoms go away with the PPI. The folks that we have a lot of trepidation about operating on is people who have a normal Demeester score, have atypical symptoms, and have no response to any PPIs. But I would tell you probably the majority of people we see are some permutation of those three, of yes and no. Um, so there's a couple of different surgical techniques that are available. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about TIFFs, um, but those are in there. Those tend to be an endoscopic-based procedure where you reform the GE junction. Um, I'm not sure if Brian will want to talk a little bit about it, that at the end. Um, I haven't. I don't have too much experience with TIBS. Um, then one slight step up to that is a, a magnetic sphincter augmentation of the GE junction, also known as a LYNX. Um, and then the more invasive sort of higher um, strength repair, I guess, is a, is a, is a fundoplication. And there's a couple different varieties of, of them of varying tightness. They have a bunch of different names. Nissen, which is a 360 degree wrap, um, uh, toupee, which is a partial wrap. And then there's some hybrid repairs of combinations of different kinds of GE junction reconstructions. And, and they're of sort of varying tightness. When I, when I say wrap, all, all of these procedures of varying degrees wrap the, the top of the stomach around the bottom of the esophagus like a scarf. Um, so what's a TIFF? It's a, a transoral and incisionless fundoplication. This is an over-the-scope device. I think this device was actually created locally. Um, it creates a, you know, a two to three centimeter partial fundoplication. It's pretty neat the way it works. I tried to embed a video in this presentation, but I, it kept failing. So I don't have a video in here, but if you, if, if you look this up on YouTube, you can, you can watch a video of this and it uses some fasteners that are made of a, of a, of a pro, almost like a proline suture to, to reform a gentle valve. There are very specific indications for this. You cannot have a large hiatal hernia. You have to have a, still a reasonable valve in terms of how, how wide open your GE junction is. And the way we grade that is with a hill grade. So that's there on the bottom left. Um, your BMI has to be under 35 and you can't have any strictures or ulcers. Um, so how well does it work? Uh, it works pretty well. Um, about 30% um, require PPIs afterwards still, but people's quality of life improves afterwards. Um, 
you know, there are some complications associated with it. I personally haven't seen any of these. Um, but what I have seen is actually, I've, as of late, I've gotten a fair amount of referrals of people who've had TIFFs elsewhere and their, um, their either hernia or their reflux has recurred uh, pretty quickly within two to three years. So I personally think the jury's still out on how well this works in particular from long-term long -term perspective. Um, have I recommended people to get it? Yes, but it, but it typically is somebody in, in which their surgical risk is too high. Um, so next step up, and this is a, a, a really neat device. This is a Lynx device. Um, you know, in its simplest sense, it's a bunch of magnets on a wire and those magnets are attracted to each other. And so in, in, in figure A here, you know, those magnets sit around the GE junction above the stomach at the bottom of the esophagus. And, and when those magnets are attracted to each other, there's a resting pressure of between 20 and 25 millimeters of mercury. Well, most of the time when you swallow, normal peristaltic pressures in your esophagus are anywhere between 35 and 80 millimeters of mercury. So that band is not so tightly, so tightly closed that it can't allow food to pass through it and, and liquid to pass through it because you have enough pressure. All the while, gastric pressure is typically between five and 10 millimeters of mercury, right? So it prevents things from going the wrong way, i.e. from your stomach into your esophagus, but it does not prevent things from being propelled forward and through it from your esophagus into your stomach, if that makes sense. Um, I think esophageal motility and lynxes is a kind of a neat research, research topic. Um, I do think there are certain people that their esophageal function is too poor to put a lynx on. Because if you think about it, it's sort of like putting a giant speed bump in front of a truck with a failing motor kind of thing. Um, so I think that's that's important um, to think about if your esophageal function is poor. A lynx may or may not be uh, a reasonable thing to try to go for. There's also some insurance peculiarities when you're dealing with lynxes. Sometimes it gets approved really fast. Sometimes it doesn't get approved at all. Um, this was one of my patients from a while ago, um, and this is a Lynx. And so the, the device goes in, it sits around your esophagus down here, just above the GE junction. Uh, this is some of the GE junction fat pad that's been removed. And it sits like that. There's a sizer that goes with it. So you make sure you don't put one on that's too tight or too loose. Um, it's pretty neat technology. Um, there's been some studies afterwards looking at, you know, just people esophageal pH normalize afterwards, you know, trying to figure out some objective measures as to whether or not it does it work. And, uh, it does. So, you know, about 67% of people have a marked drop in esophageal acid exposure. Um, and there's normalization in around 60%. So it's a, it's, it's a home run in about 60% of people. And in the other, in the other percentage, it's a, you know, a double or a triple. Um, outcomes afterwards, I think there are some more updated papers. I just didn't really have much time to include them in here, but these are, you know, quality of life data at one, two, and three years. I think Brian may have been on this paper actually. Um, and most people are satisfied afterwards. So people's quality of life continues to improve up to three years. Um, there are a small percentage of people who are unhappy after, after a Lynx. Um, but that is, uh, in the minority, um, and this goes for most of the symptoms that people typically, uh, experience, right? So regurgitative symptoms get better, dysphagia gets better and severity of esophagitis gets better. Um, so I guess, you know, overall, what are the, what are the, what are the goals of surgery, right? So I, I glossed over this a little bit in a lynx, you know, your goal is to close the hiatus and repair any hiatal hernias as well. But we're gonna move forward and talk about fundoplications now. So, so, you know, goal number one is, you know, get the stomach back into the abdomen where it's supposed to go. Make sure you close the esophageal hiatus. That's those muscle fibers that the esophagus passes through. And then you wanna make sure you get enough length back in the abdomen, because that's really how you, you you reestablish the stomach being where it's supposed to be. If you don't, if you can't get enough length of esophagus in the abdomen, your, the stomach just springs right back up because it's under too much tension. 
so once you once you're able to do that that's component number one right to to repair the hiatus component number two is to try to reestablish the structural integrity of your lower soft gel sphincter and that's where these fundoplications come into play so i mentioned before there's varying tightnesses of wraps and this is 360 degrees it gets you know your stomach gets wrapped around your esophagus like a scarf all the way around a toupee that's the name toupee not hair toupee um is a 270 degree wrap um and then there's a couple other sort of various fundoplications you know there's a hill repair which is less commonly performed and then there's a hybrid hill repair which is a fundoplication plus some other sutures that try to tack your your fix your GE junction intra-abdominally with some sutures that go to a very robust um, uh, tissue layer that sits right in front of your aorta. Um, so I guess, you know, what to expect, because that's probably one of the reasons why a lot of people are on the phone call. So the vast majority of these, of these surgery, surgeries are laparoscopic. I've never even seen an open fundoplication or hiatal hernia repair. Um, that's just, that just wasn't a thing when I was training and I haven't had a reason to do one open, uh, since I've been here. Um, most people it's an overnight hospital stay, you know, so 23 hours sort of thing. Uh, we sort of mandate that people are up and walking the same day of surgery. That just helps prevent the preventable stuff, pneumonias and blood clots and all that stuff that can happen after surgery. Um, typically people get some pain meds for a few days afterwards. We like people to be off those pretty quickly because opioids, Postoperatively tend to lead to constipation and nausea and constipation tends to lead to bearing down and bearing down too much tends to lead to failures of GE junction repairs. So we want to get people off of that stuff pretty quickly. Um, there are some pretty heavy duty diet restrictions afterwards, but they ended about six weeks. Uh, so you're, we watch on full liquids for two weeks after the surgery. That tends to be, you know, smoothies, milkshakes, you know, nothing with seeds in it, nothing with chunks of uh, fruit. And then after those two weeks, so postoperative weeks two to six, it's so, it's soft food, right? So, you know, eggs, mashed potatoes, sloppy joes, you know, if, if pasta is cooked al dente at eight minutes, cook it for 15 minutes, that sort of thing. Um, and no heavy lifting, six weeks. Sometimes the no heavy lifting can go longer than that if we're worried about the, the repairs. So this is just some operative photos. And then this is what a hiatal hernia looks like. So you're, this is a camera that's placed just above your belly button and it look, it's looking up towards your head. So this is your, this is your diaphragm. This is part of your liver called the caudate lobe. This is your stomach and this is your cura. So this is a wide open hiatus and your stomach is going up and into your chest. This is what it looks like after we're done, right? So you have the esophagus is now in, you know, you have a couple centimeters of esophagus in the abdomen. Your stomach is off the screen because it's in your abdomen. This is the left diaphragmatic cruise, right diaphragmatic cruise, vena cava, caudate lobe. And then we start to reconstruct things. And that's what the next photos are going to show. So that's the hiatus closed. This is a schematic of what a Nissen looks like. So we're taking the top of your stomach, which is your fundus, we're wrapping it behind your esophagus, we're looping it back on itself, and we're, we're suturing it. So if you go 360 degrees, that's a Nissen. If you go 240 or 270 degrees, that's a toupee. Sort of looks like a hot dog in a bun. With This is your esophagus, and these are the sides of the the stomach so to the sides of the esophagus. And, there, and this reforms the valve when you look endoscopically. Um, this is a Nissen. Again, you know, it, instead of it looking like a hot dog, you're wrapping, you, you're suturing stomach to stomach. And these tend to be short and floppy. Uh, you want these to be about three centimeters in length and you don't want them to be too tight because, you know, you don't want to give somebody dysphagia after you do this. Um, this is an, a neat, hybrid repair that one of our former partners, along with Dr. Louie, kind of invented. Um, you know, it, it involves two different components. You know, one of the problems with Nissen's is the wrap can sometimes wind up back in your chest if it recurs. And so these are extra sutures that are placed um, to try to anchor the, the GE junction in the abdomen and prevent everything from herniating up. 
Um, you know, like anything else, there's some pros and cons to it. You know, there are some, um, uh, you know, some people that this is a good repair for. There's some people that it's not. Um, but that's an that's an option that's out there. And so, how do people do after surgery? You know, I think that one of the big comparators is you know comparing it to PPIs. So, you know, this is one study that showed that there's not a big difference in long-term swallowing. You get an improvement in heartburn with surgery versus PPI in the short term. It's about double in the medium term. It's more so, and then in the long term, you know, people tend to be pretty happy. Um, I can't remember how they define long term in this study, but uh, there's improvement in symptoms with heartburn and regurgitation with surgery compared to PPIs. Um, you know, what are the pros and cons? You know, the the pros of surgery is, you know, it makes life more normal again, right? It's less of a pill. Um, in particular, people who have obstructive symptoms from big hiatal hernias, eating becomes just that. It's, it's eating. Like it's not a, it's not this, you know, big fiasco of, you know, you have to eat these small meals and it takes, you know, two hours to eat them because it hurts when you eat. Um, a lot of people are off medication. What are the cons of surgery? Well, it's surgery, right? So there's there's risks associated with surgery. Um, if you meet a surgeon who tells you there's no risks to a surgery, you should walk out because there's always risks to surgery, right? The, the mortality rate is very low. It's 0.1%, but it has happened. The risk of complications is, you know, between one and 5%. There are some short, there's a short-term investment, like I mentioned, right? You have to change your diet and there's activity restrictions. And then long-term, there's some changes from related to the surgical physiology. It's difficult to belch. Some people can, some people can. Gas bloat is uh, uh, a big one. Um, most of the time it's self-limiting, but it can be a little bit uncomfortable perioperatively. Because if you, because if you think about it, right? We're, we're making it so that you can't have reflux. And one of the ways that your body naturally has a pop-off valve for your stomach over distending is people belch, right? When you swallow air after surgery, that gas has to go some direction. So it tends to go down and it makes people bloated. So that can lead to certain food intolerances that can make people bloated. Luckily it's, it's, you know, mostly self-limiting, there are some things that people can do afterwards. Some of them are really simple, like using Beano. Some of them involve uh, some of them involve uh, avoiding certain foods that are known to be bloating. Onions is a big one. You may, onions, when they get broken down, it makes a lot of gas in your GI tract. Um, and then there's recurrences, right? I would love to tell you that you know every one of these surgeries we've all done has worked forever, but that's not true either. Hernias can recur. Uh, there are variable recurrence rates depending on what surgery you look at. Um, just from my my view of um, uh, the literature that I know well, people with bigger hernias tend to have higher recurrence rates. So I guess in summary, uh, GERD is common. Thankfully, it's very rarely life-threatening or a major threat to health. It does have an impact on people's quality of life and our health system, our, our healthcare system. Um, and it can be modified by lifestyle changes, which can reduce the amount of reflux, but surgery is, has a role to play for certain people that do not do well with medications and conservative measures. Um, antacids and anti-secretory medications reduce acid, but they often don't reduce the reflux, right? So you'll shut down acid production, but there's still liquid that can often wind up up there. Um, also, antacids and anti-secretory medications don't do anything for bile reflux, right? That's that's a whole different ball game. Um, PPIs are safe, uh, but you know their long term use. There's a little bit of question about you know what are the side effects of it. Um, I think I personally think that's going to be a very hard study to do, just because it's you're looking at rare events, um, and so I'm not sure that anyone's going to be able to figure out you know causation. Uh, but there's some associations that are out there. Um, there is a spectrum of therapeutic interventions that are available, ranging from TIFs, like I mentioned, to fundoplications, and each one of those has its own unique set of uh, risks and benefits. And that's all I got. Thank you, Dr. Bograd, uh, for giving that great talk. Uh, there's been people posting questions in the chat, and I've been trying to keep track of them.
Uh, I've answered a couple of them because they're very specific questions by some some of the participants tonight. So uh, I, I answered some of those ones because they they are very specific. But there's some there's have been some general questions that people would like to know about. And um, um, the first question from one of the guests is, um, what about symptoms that occur when you're bending or lying over and food and liquids are coming up? What do you think about those symptoms and how important are those? Yeah, so I think that can be predominant in some in some people. Um, you know, where I, where I've seen it the most is in people with hernias, right? So you, you have, a it's almost like a double stomach where you have stuff that's caught in the thoracic part of the stomach and then people lean over and it just sort of dribbles out of your mouth. Um, I have people had that as a symptom and has it gotten better with surgery? Yes. I couldn't, I couldn't give you numbers though. I would have to look back, but yeah, it's, it's. If people mention it. Um, I haven't seen it as an overly common symptom in the patients I've seen, but I do, I can think of a handful of people who have had it and it's gotten better after surgery. Yeah. The next question, which I think is a very, very good question is one of the participants asks, how do you decide of all the options you've described, how do you decide between the various options, between the fundifications, between links? How do you help patients make those decisions? So, so I think, I think number one, it depends, you know, what does the objective data look like, right? So there's a reason we ask people to get EGDs and manometry and, and pH testing and in an upper GI series. And then sometimes there's some other um, adjuncts to that, because sometimes those studies bring up more questions. And so I think that's, in my mind, that's, that's the first thing I look at. Um, if all options are available, I think it's a, you know, pros and cons discussion, right? There are, there are certain, you know, what is, what is important to the patient? Like, what is the single thing that's most important to them? Are they okay if they have some gas bloat afterwards, but they really, really, really want to, they really, really, really want to shut down acid production because they have Barrett's that, you know, needs to get dealt with. You know, that's an instance where I'd probably push somebody to, to, to think about a Nissen versus somebody who's petrified of bloating or has some IBS symptoms and they don't want to get them exacerbated by bloating, well, maybe something that's a little bit looser is a better idea for them, like a like a toupee or a lynx. So I think it's very, in my mind, it's very person dependent um, and what they want their goals to be. Uh, and, you know, one of the questions that I typically ask people in the office is, you know, what is the what is the single thing that bothers you the most? Or what is the single thing that you want fixed, right? Because I think it's helpful to have a focused goal. Um, I think where I've seen other folks get into trouble uh, is, you know, trying to hit a home run every single time because there's going to be trade-offs, right? You know, there's certain things that, you know, you have to accept one thing in order to get, you know, the other thing. And so, uh, you know, that's, and it's just a, it's a dialogue, right? Like I don't, I, you just have to discuss about all the discuss all the options. But if something is a bad idea and somebody says I want to do this, I'll I'm not shy. I'll tell you it's a bad idea. Well, I think that's a great answer. I think you know all all four surgeons, all four of us try to try to have those same conversations as Dr. Bogart said with each of our patients, trying to solve the problems that they're having. Uh, there is a question in here, Dr. Bograd, about uh, you, you sort of hit upon the negative effects of PPIs, but some of the folks were curious to know what your thoughts are about PPIs and dementia and PPIs and osteoporosis or bone density. I, you know what, I haven't really read a terrible amount about the dementia part of it. I know that data is out there. You know, the, the, the one thing that I have seen, though, is I have seen chronic PPI use, particularly in women, exacerbate bone loss. And it just has to do with calcium metabolism and you know inability to absorb dietary calcium. Um, so I have seen that. Uh, I have operated on a number of people who their uh, endocrinologist or their rheumatologist or their PCP is saying, I don't want her on this medication anymore. And so that that has been an indication to operate on, on some folks. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I, I don't know a terrible amount about, you know, the, 
dementia PPI link. It's just not something I've read a ton about. So I don't want to, I don't want to misspeak. It's funny that question got answered because we had some emails floating around this morning about what to do for the next journal club. And that was one of the things that one of my partners brought up. Yeah, I, you know, I had a chance, Adam, after the emails went around this morning to sort of quickly look at it because I, you know, older studies on dementia were not well done. They were methodologically or scientifically flawed and they didn't consider other reasons for dementia. Uh, but there were a couple studies that came out late actually in the last couple months that uh, I wasn't aware of either and um, suggesting that um, that this might be true and this has got picked up by the popular press but uh, uh, from what I can read of uh, those studies I, I think there's still some question about whether you can prove that PPIs cause dementia at this point in time. And so I would say it's not fully proven and nobody's certain about what, what to do about the dementia aspect of things. And I so, think it's going to be, it's, 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 it would be a very hard study to do, right? Cause you know, dementia is one of those things that tends to be very multifactorial. And so pinning it down to whether or not somebody's on one medication or not, because, you know, somebody, you know, Mr. Smith who has dementia is different than Miss you know, Thomas, who has dementia, and they all have different medical backgrounds. And so I, I would have to personally read a very convincing study to demonstrate causation in which they would have to have a perfectly matched group A versus group B. And really the only difference is, you know, one group is on PPIs versus the other group. And then they would have to be matched to, you know, they have to be taking them similar amounts of time and i just i think that's going to be a really hard study to do i personally don't think it'll ever get done i think there's going to be a lot of studies that out there that show associations but not causations and then it just comes back to you know what do you do with that data i have no clue honestly so the next question then dr bogart is how does the lynx device work is it like the flat valve or how does it improve a failing flat valve so, you know, the way I think about it is, you know, you have to repair the hiatus, right? Because that's a that's a component of, you know, a competent GE junction, right? Mm -hmm. So the hiatus gets repaired. Uh, the way I think about it is it just provides structural integrity to your GE junction where there wasn't any. Just sort of like giving it a gentle hug, right? Um, I don't, I don't think it truly recreates a flat valve. I could be wrong. But it 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 encircles your esophagus and it kind of forms a new valve, I guess. That's the way I would think about it. Um, Fair enough. Yeah. The next question is, do you have an opinion on Strata for the treatment of GERD or LPR? Strata? I'll, I'll I'll tell you what what Dr. A told me. He told me not to learn how to do it because it doesn't work. That's what I, that's what I, that's what Dr. A told me. So I don't I don't really have uh, an opinion on it other than that. Other than I never learned how to do it because somebody who was very 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 experienced told me not to learn how to do it. Yeah, and I, I would have to, you know, I would have to sort of agree. The data on Strata is not clear. Um, I, might be the only, I might be the only one of the group who will still do one, but it's very, very selective about who you would offer Strata to. Um, plus, exceptionally difficult to get insurance authorization yeah. for Strata. Um, there's probably a role for it in a very, very select group of patients, but... Uh, not for most, not for most of the patients who end up seeing the surgeon. That would it's be a neat concept. Like I have, I've, I've read about it. It's a very neat concept. I just, I have to, you know, there's at a certain at a certain point you have to take the advice of somebody who'd been doing this for a very long time, and I, I was somebody I trust inherently told me that, and so I got to trust them. So I, I personally, I've never done one. I've never seen one. I don't think I, I don't offer it currently. I don't think I'll ever offer it. Um, but that's just, I was influenced by a conversation I had very early on. 
but for the participant who asked that question, uh, that may be worth the conversation in the office, um, simply because that's a, a long conversation uh, about Strata and whether it's appropriate for you. And um, uh, that would be my suggestion. Next question, Dr. Bogart, is I, I, I've heard a lot about bad experiences with Nissan fundifications. Uh, what's your, been your personal experience, uh, and uh, can you tell me about the outcomes of the Hill procedure? Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll take the, the the first question first. So um, have do I have patients who are have been unhappy after a Nissan? Yes, it tends to be the bloating uh, that the people have complained about. Um, I would say more people are happy than not happy. I would like to think that has to do a little bit with my patient selection um, and really honing down on operating on people that I think I can help. Um, but I, 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 I haven't had many people who have been unhappy afterwards, but I will tell you the ones that stick out in my mind who have had a Nissan who are unhappy afterwards, it tended to be the bloating. And I have one person, um, and we, we talked about her at our swallow conference at one time who had, she had very normal esophageal motility going into the surgery. We did a Nissen. And then for some reason, her esophageal motility has gotten increasingly poor after her, after her Nissen. And she has dysphagia afterwards. She has trouble swallowing. And so she, she sticks out in my mind. So it's not a ton of people who are unhappy, but yeah, totally. I have people who have been unhappy after uh, a Nissen. Luckily, that's the vast minority, uh, thankfully. Um, but, you know, you know, life afterwards is mostly normal. Um, people have the ability to eat and drink. There are some things that will bug you a little bit more afterwards, you know, stuff that tends to make people a little more bloating, but, you know, usually, you know, the human body is pretty smart. It tends to figure out what it likes to eat and what it doesn't like to eat. You may have some things that you have to avoid. You know, one of the things I tell people is, you know, you're going to be able to tell me much better than I can tell you what you can and can't eat afterwards. So for me to give a list of, you know, food items and things like that, that everyone's going to be able to eat, that would not be truthful. Uh, but there'll be some things that, you may or may not be able to eat afterwards, um, but most people are happy afterwards, honestly. Um, and again, I'd like to think that has to do a little bit with my patient selection. Um, but I, you know, I do have people that, you know, the bloating is bothersome afterwards. I have that one person who has dysphagia afterwards, um, but most of the time people are happy and they, you know, the, you know, the thing, what people remark the most to me personally, I don't know if Brian can chime in at some point here afterwards also is, you know, food should be enjoyable and there's certain, there's certain food items that people really enjoy eating. And some people don't notice how much they enjoy eating those sort of things until they're taken away from them until they can't eat them. So, you know, something as simple as pasta or, you know, having a glass of wine or something like that, people really like being able to go back and doing that without feeling like their chest is on fire for the next six hours. Like, so, so that's probably the thing that's been remarked about the most. And I've forgotten the second question already. Well, I'll get to the second question. I would tell you that I would tell the group that, uh, are there bad experiences with a Nissan? I agree with Dr. Bogart. Yes, there are bad experiences with a Nissan. I think if you're seeing a surgeon who does a lot of them and has a lot of experience, generally, the good outweighs the bad by a long shot, and most of the patients would tell you they wish they'd done it sooner. Having said that, we've moved a lot to partial fundification because the side effects are less and the reflux control is, a, is a equally as good. And so uh, the number of Nissans that we do as a group has dropped over the last few years because uh, we, we, along with other surgeons in the country, have made significant improvements in the way partial fundifications are created. And so we see that as a, a significant benefit. The other question, Dr. Bograd, was about the Hill procedure. And there were a couple of them. Is Hill better than Nissen? And what are the outcomes of the Hill procedure? Now, I don't, if you, I don't, if you want yeah, me to answer that, I'm happy to. Yeah, I don't know a ton about Hills because I've, I've, Dr. A used to do a ton of them. 
I've never even seen one. I I know the technical details of it. I think it has some pros and cons compared to Nissan's in terms of anchoring the junction in the abdomen and preventing certain types of recurrences. Uh, but I, I've actually not taken care of anyone who had a hill. Uh, I've never done one myself. Um, they're not super common. Um, so I would, I would, I would have a hard time answering that question, honestly. I would tell you that Dr. A's patients who have had a hill procedure have generally done very well. Um, and I might be the last of the, the surgeons at Swedish who has seen and done a hill procedure. Um, because um, Dr. A did most of them before his retirement a couple of years ago. Um, are they more successful in this? And they're just really different than in this. Um, the hill repairs still fail at a similar rate to the Nissan fundifications. They have probably more trouble swallowing. Uh, they probably over time have less successful reflux control because of the way the hill repair is built. But they have, uh, they are still just as, uh, you know, they have similar but very different uh, different experiences uh, are what the patients would tell you. Um, there is a question here about with the TIF procedure, is there a lifelong weight lifting limit? Um, I, I would say that I'm not aware of one, Adam. Have you no, heard of that? No, none that, none, none that I'm aware of. No. Okay. Yeah, and after the first healing period uh, as a group, we don't have a weightlifting restriction. Once you're out past a, a healing period that the surgeons are happy with, uh, we, we don't have uh, that because we can't keep people from doing things. That that doesn't make much sense. Uh, the next question, Dr. Bogart, is can GERD cause general anxiety and can GERD cause tinnitus, uh, which is ringing of the ears or hearing loss? Uh, I've never heard of the tinnitus one. Um, I think the GERD and anxiety is sort of chicken and egg. Uh, I don't know if people get GERD because they're anxious or are people anxious because they have GERD. So I don't know if I could honestly answer that. Uh, I do think that people expecting themselves to have reflux in certain situations can probably bring on anxiety. But there is a lot of data showing that the, the gut and the brain are linked. Um, and so I suspect anxiety or high anxiety states can cause people to have GERD. Well, there's, actually, there's actually a neat book about this called The Second Brain. Well, I think it's like the question about stress and, and stress. Yeah. How does that cause uh, GERD? And you talk to working folks, uh, they're on holidays, they retire, their GERD gets dramatically better. So as Dr. Bogart points out, there is a, uh, a gut-brain interaction, uh, which um, I think we're just starting to uncover that, those connections as opposed to we know a lot about them, shall we say. Dr. Bogart, the next question is, if you have Barrett's esophagus that's non-dysplastic, does this get treated before surgery? Um. So if there's if there's no dysplasia, there shouldn't you, you shouldn't need to have any ablative therapies. Um, if there is dysplasia, that should get eradicated before proceeding on with any fundoplication. At least that's the way I, that's the way I understand it, and the way I understand the guidelines, unless they've changed recently. So non dysplastic non dysplastic Barrett's shouldn't need to get ablated. Uh, and there's some data that shows that you actually can get regression of non-dysplastic Barrett's with adequate acid and sometimes bile, uh, preventing that reflux. And one of the key components in that is sometimes a fund application. I wouldn't call these surgeries anti-cancer surgeries, though. I don't want to. I don't want that to. I don't. I don't want that to get surmised from what I just said, because that hasn't been proven. The next question is, what are the long-term risks of living with GERD on medications, still having symptoms rather than getting surgery? Yeah, it's tough. It's tough to predict, right? So there's a, there's a small, there's a small percentage of people who, you know, their GERD will progress down the GERD, Barrett's, dysplasia from Barrett's, you know, low grade, high grade, and then adenocarcinoma. Um, 
it's not a large percentage of people. However, if you're if you're one of those people, that's right. That's that's pretty important. So there there is a risk, and you know people surmise that that's one of the reasons why adenocarcinoma rates are increasing in the U.S. Right? It's you know this over preponderance of of reflux, untreated reflux. Um, again, I think that's going to be a very hard study to do because I'm not sure how you randomize people if you if you think somebody has one arm is going to give you cancer. Like I, I don't think that study will ever get done, honestly. But, um, but there are risks to living with GERD. You know, more less likely than cancer related risks are all the other risks, right? So, uh, aspiration and you know sinusitis and you know iron deficiency anemia from ulcers and you know having a large hernia and you can get obstructive symptoms and you know vomiting and those are probably more common than cancer um, which i suspect is way is under one percent way under one percent probably well Greg, the next question is is does long-term ppi use worse than the hiatal hernia no True, true, and unrelated. The so, next question is, if I've had the testing done that you've talked about and mentioned, how long is how long is that testing good for? Um, I, I I can talk I can talk about personally what what I do, and then I guess Brian could chime in and, and tell him. So I think once you've had pH testing that shows you're positive, unless you've had some major drastic lifestyle change, i.e. Your pH testing was positive when your BMI was 45. You've lost 200 pounds and now you're a totally different person. I think those are very different instances in looking at somebody's pH. However, outside of that context, I think once your pH testing is positive, your pH testing is positive. The stuff that I do want to have in less than a year, right? So within a year, I want to make sure we have an accurate endoscopy, an accurate swallow study, and an accurate manometry, because those are some of the things that can influence surgical approach, what you're expecting in the operating room. And the manometry is really important, right? If you're doing an operation based off manometry that was five years old, you might do the wrong thing. Yeah, I, I you know, I think when I agree with Dr. Walker, once you've had pH testing, I think we're good unless you've had a dramatic change in your life events. and. Um, uh, I I will generally push some of the studies he said he would like within a year, slightly over a year, depending on the situation. But if there's a change in your symptoms, it's worthwhile updating them because you want to make sure you're operating on the correct data within that year. Um, next question, Dr. Bogart, is if I've had a toupee, can it be revised if it's not working as well? And could I go to a 360 Nissen after a toupee is a, is one of the questions. Yeah, so you can do you can do redo operations. Uh, the risk profile is slightly different than the first operation, right? Because you're you're you have to number one, most people have a a, a recurrent hiatal hernia, right? So you have to dissect out a a, a a hiatus that's already been dissected out and repaired once, and then you have to take down the wrap and redo the wrap. You can't just sort of put some plicating sutures in and, and, and quote unquote, tighten things up. You typically want to reestablish what normal anatomy was and then redo the wrap um, because you don't want to malform, malform the wrap. So yes, you can. Um, the risk profile is slightly different than, than a, you know, a de novo um, fundoplication. Uh, but yeah, you can do, you can do reoperations. Next question is, is the hiatal hernia the most important thing to fix? Uh, define important. <laughs> I'll throw the question back at whoever asked it. Uh, uh, I don't think we're going to, we're not going to let them speak, but. Uh, um, it depends how you define it. I, I mean, I think it's, it's like. I guess it depends what your symptoms are. If you have a massive parasophageal hernia and your pr predominant symptoms are obstructive and you're 80, right? 
you know, my main goal is fix your obstructive symptoms. Right. Which means you fix the height, you get the stomach down, you fix the hiatus and maybe a, maybe a wrap or fun application for them is less important. Right. Because the, the least of all evils is, you know, maybe you just need to be on a PPI and you can eat normal. Now you don't have all these horrible obstructive symptoms. So in that case, I would say it's important. But I think in, in other instances, you know, small hernias, I would say the hiatus is part of the part of the repair, but you're, you know, you're only doing 50% of a surgery if you don't do a, something to the GE junction, right? Because, you know, if somebody has a, you know, a three centimeter hernia and they have severe reflux, you probably should be doing, you should be doing something in terms of a wrap or something to augment the GE junction as opposed to just fixing the hernia because I think you'll probably still have symptoms afterwards. So it's, it's hard. I don't know how you define important, but I think it's person dependent and I think it's a, it's a component of the repair and they're equal. They're fairly equal importance in certain people and other, other people, you know, it's, it might be less important, right? The fund application may be less important. Right. The next question is, are the surgical options for a patient with LPR the same as those with GERD? Yes. I don't know if they would be much different because you, you're trying to prevent reflux and it would be a very similar conversation. You know, that, that tends to be people who have, you know, pretty high up reflux stuff reaching a proximal sensor on a on a um, on an old school 24 hour ph probe um i have i haven't operated on a ton of people with lpr i have a i have a handful of them uh, i've done nissens on all of them and all of them have been happy their lpr is gone so they're happy um, i have not done any partials on lpr patients so i don't have a super vast experience spanning multiple different fund applications for LPR. Um, luckily, I've been lucky. They've all had normal manometry. <laughs> so. Yeah, and I would I would go back to the comment you made before. I think all the surgical options that Dr. Bograd described are eligible for LPR patients. And I would tell you, just like he said before, we're going to try to match the operation to the patient who's there because that particular patient may gravitate towards a Nissen, that patient may gravitate towards a Lynx. It will depend heavily on who you are as a patient and what you are willing to tolerate. But uh, that's how I would sort of think, that's how I think about the problem. Uh, and um, and it depends uh, heavily. And uh, Dr. Bograd's original comments about matching it and trying to figure out who you are, what you would like to relieve, those are the key components to that discussion with any of us, any of the surgeons. I think it, it depends on, you know, you really have to, the discussions are hard in the office, right? Like, I, I think sometimes some folks come into the office and, you know, they, you know, they got scoped at, you know, St. Elsewhere's and they said they have a hiatal hernia and people come in, they're like, I just want my hernia fixed. It's like, okay, like how, like how exactly do you want to do it? Like, should we just guess? It's all the data. It, it seems annoying you know, when you show up and we have to sometimes repeat an endoscopy and get manometry and, you know, do all the stuff that's, you know, some of it could be uncomfortable to do. The whole reason we're doing that is to figure out what's the right thing to do. Um, I personally never want to be the hammer nail person. That's just not me. I don't want to be like that. If you're constantly just, you know, if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, everything's going to look like a nail, right? So you, you really, you want to be thoughtful about what you're doing. Because I, I personally think, and my bias is, if, you, if you're doing the same thing for everybody, you're going to get in trouble for something. Like you're, you're not, you're going to do the wrong surgery at some point. And so you got to, that discussion is, you know, sometimes time consuming and it can take a long time from the time you first see us till the time you actually wind up in the office to you, till the time you actually wind up getting surgery. Or sometimes surgery is not the right thing to do, right? Um. But I think, you know, especially when you're dealing with 
you know, an elective, most of the time, not life-threatening problem, you have to be thoughtful about it. Dr. Bograd, the next question is, does Lynx offer more gas relief than fundification? Uh, like in terms of to the side effects, I think. That's like in terms of belching? Yeah, or less less bloating, less flatulence. I think that's what the question is implying. Yeah, I've had I've had very few conversations with people I've put lynxes in have issues with bloating. That's just my personal experience. I don't know um, if everybody's experience is, has been like that, uh, but you can still belch with a you can still belch with a with a, a lynx. Um, what sometimes is the trade off is is early on. Uh, sometimes people can get some pretty wicked dysphagia perioperatively that uh, luckily is not very common. But, you know, that links that's there, you can get some swelling. Sometimes you need to go on a slight steroid taper. Some people need to get a, a dilation early on. I haven't had to dilate anybody, but um, I've heard of people having to. Um, I have not had a lot of patients who have had lynxes who have had wicked gas bloat afterwards. And maybe I've just been lucky so far, or maybe they've been lucky so far is the better way to term it, I guess. Uh, my experience has been very similar to yours. I think Lynx does not have as, as much of the gas-related issues uh, than fundification if you're a candidate for Lynx. Yeah, because you can belch, right? It makes sense, right? It, you know, if you swallow a bunch of air, you know, air's got to go out one way or the other, right? It's either coming out the bottom or coming out the top. And so if you can still belch, that's, that's a, that's a pop-off valve that you know, you can relieve some of the gas. The next question is, is can we expect to have any big changes or discoveries in the treatment of GERD in the next one to three years? I'm going to, I'm going to bump that Brian's way. <laughs> uh, yeah. So there are a couple of big announcements. Uh, this past week, the FDA approved a new medication called Venoprazan. Uh, this is a new GERD medication that the FDA has approved. Uh, and will be available most likely in December or early January in pharmacies. Uh, you can expect that that's going to be pricey as the new drug. Uh, been available in uh, Asia, I believe, for many years. Uh, works very differently than PPIs. Um, so we'll wait and see how that looks. And on the surgical side, there is a new device that's being that's just starting clinical trials in in one center, or two centers in the United States. And I uh, I know that because I'm part of the data, I'm part of the trial uh, management group. Um, so we'll wait and see if that has any bearing. I, I can't tell you much more than that because it's all trial based and there's a the company's got it quite quiet, but uh, yes, there are always things coming out in the GERD space, so stay tuned, keep an eye on things. Um, but as you can imagine, Lynx has been around for now a decade, and um, and it's taken that a long time to get going. So uh, things will come and go, but there will be new things in the future. Uh, Dr. Bogart, somebody wanted you to list the book, uh, The Brain-Gut Connection, in the chat. Yeah, it's, it's called, I, I believe it's called The Second Brain, and the author is Michael Gershon, G-E-R-S-H-O-N. He's He was one of my professors in med school. Let's see, while you're talking and answering the next movie, I'll see if I can Google that and put it in the chat for folks. Do probiotics help with any of these problems? Sometimes, yes. And then, what they're are pretty, that's, yeah. they're pretty They're pretty low risk, right? So if if eating some yogurt makes you feel better, go for it. Then do, sorry, would a person's BMI limit their options or change what you would offer? Yeah, so I think most of us are pretty, uh, you know, there's a little bit of wiggle room, but for the most part, elective fundal applications and GE junction repairs, the BMI is 35, 35 or under. There are some instances in, if people have a large hernia or, you know, crescendo symptoms, uh, where we'll, we'll, we'll put that up a little bit, but, you know, you, you shouldn't typically be operating too often on folks with a BMI over 35 doing elective GE junction repairs. There's a fair amount of data that shows that their failure rates are high. Sometimes a good option is bariatric surgery, right? 
So, you know, one of the ultimate anti-reflux procedures is a ruin Y gastric bypass. And then the next question, um, I'm not sure either of us have an answer to this. It's thoughts uh, on Fos Fosemprenivir, which is Lexiba for treating reflux. Um, I'd looked that up while the while you were talking. That is a an HIV drug. Uh, I I'm not aware of any study or any effect of that drug on reflux, as far as I know. Uh, and I'm you know I, I I'm guessing you're as stumped as I am. Better question for a gastroenterologist than a surgeon. Yeah. Um, next question: Where would regurgitation during surgery fall on? the need or not of a surgical fix. I'm guessing the question is, is if you have regurgitation, how, where does surgery fall in relation to controlling that? I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure I entirely understand the question, but if, if, you know, if a predominant symptom is regurgitation, then that would be your troublesome symptom that is causing problems with your quality of life, right? That's the way I would. That's the way I would look at it. People have different presentations of GERD. There's different. There's different symptomatologies to people. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I totally understand the question, so I'm not completely sure how to answer it. Yeah, yeah. I think if the participant wants to repost the question or clarify that in the chat, that would be helpful. Um, the next question is: What causes a hiatal hernia to worsen or enlarge? Ooh, uh, I don't, um, I don't think anybody knows. I mean, it has to do with, you know, tissue quality and it's a pressure thing, right? The more pressure you have pushing up from your belly up into your chest. Um, yeah, I, I think you're right. I don't think we know. I don't think uh, anyone knows. We do know that from our, our uh, colleagues in Providence, Portland, that, 40 to 50% of hiatal hernias will enlarge over time, uh, but we don't know why. Uh, I think Dr. Bograd is correct. Tissue quality, pressure, those things are the things that are there. And then for those folks who have um, scoliosis or they have kyphoses, uh, particularly women as they get older, those can worsen your hiatal hernia as well because of the spine. Um, but other than that, I don't think people have taken that apart yet. Um, next question, do your patients with LBR, LPR usually have symptoms that are obvious? No, there's so, so some of the hardest patients that I personally take care of have been LPR patients. Um, the it's, you know, typically people go down this wormhole of diagnostics before it, people think about reflux. Um, and so it tends to be a, a long road before they get to us, number one. And then number two, you know, LPR and some of the crossover with other symptoms, sort of head and neck symptoms, it's really hard to figure out, in, in my mind, what symptoms are actually attributable to LPR and what are attributable to other factors, you know, sinusitis and postnasal drip and uh, you know, all sorts of other things that are up here. So I, I personally think those are some of the more difficult diagnostic things. And I actually get a fair amount of like agita having those conversations because some of the LPR, you know, whether or not people will respond well to surgery is sort of a coin flip, right? Um, whereas, you know, some of the, some people, they're super happy with the results of their surgery, but then other folks, you know, throat clearing is one, right? So, so this sort of like, you know, this chronic sort of throat clearing. Sometimes by the time people get you, they've been doing it so long, it's almost behavioral, where even though, you know, I have somebody who I did a Nissan on for LPR, their pH testing is pristine. I've done Bravo testing, which only tests acid. I've done a nasal pH probe, an impedance pH probe, which tests for weak acid and, and non-acid reflux. They're all normal he will not stop throat clearing. He just does it chronically, this guy. And so it 
I think it's almost behavioral at this point where somebody has gotten so used to doing something that it's really hard to extinguish. So I, I think LPR is actually one of the more difficult things. And I, I tend to be very conservative with operating in the context of LPR. And it's a very, it's a, it's multiple discussions. You know, it's very upfront, you know, you know, these are the risks of the surgery. These are the goals, you know, you know, these papers show that this percent chance of resolution, but LPR is actually very, in my mind, it's very difficult actually. Yeah, I, I agree with Dr. Bogart. LPR is not always obvious. Uh, it requires a lot of testing and a lot, a lot of conversation before we'll go to the operating room because um, selection of those patients is probably the most critical to get a good outcome. Next question, Dr. Bogart, is can you still have an endoscopy after Nissen? Yes, you can. Yeah, whether you've had a fundamentation or not should not uh, preclude so. you from having an endoscopy. Uh, somebody asked about spelling the name of the new drug. I put that in the chat uh, for folks. It's called Venoprazan. Uh, I also put in the chat uh, the name of the book that Dr. Bogart was talking about by Dr. Or by Michael Gershon. I found that. Uh, the participant who was asking about the regurgitation question, Dr. Bogart, mm -hmm. says that she is regurgitated on the surgery table, probably for another surgery. That would probably be a concerning issue for just general regurgitation and reflux in general, I would think, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would I would I would have a hard time surmising why somebody regurgitated on the operative table or not. Um, I think there's a lot of things that could lead to that or not lead to that. So I don't want to I don't want to guess. Well Dr. Bogart, I think we are We've concluded all the questions. Um, I want to thank folks for joining us tonight. Um, I believe the organizers are going to send out a follow-up email in case you have other questions. This, as you know, has been recorded, so you can watch it again. And uh, for those who had questions they didn't want to post or still want to have answered, I would encourage you to talk to your primary care physician. I would encourage you, if you have reflux and symptoms like Dr. Bogart and Scott have described, uh, certainly I would um, you know consider come seeing us at some point in time. And um, uh, again, we'll I think we do this once a year for the organization as part of our practice, and so you know we'll be back on in a year, and uh, we'll see you guys all then. Thank you very much for attending, Dr. Bogart. Thank you for your time. Thank you.